The great complaint about the queen after the death of Diana was that she wasn't mothering the country. She wasn't down in London. She didn't have the flag flying at half-mast. From the queen's point of view, the people in London with their flowers could go hang. Her priority was her grandsons, who suddenly had no mother, whose other grandmother was not much use anyway. But there she was in Balmoral. It was the ideal place for these young boys to go out shooting and stalking and on their scramble bikes. And Peter Phillips, uh, Princess Anne's son, was there, and he would take them out. And Prince Philip would cook a barbecue in the evening, and then they'd all gather around and do the washing up together. That was her priority. She was thinking only of that. So as these reports came up over the line, she never watches television anyway. So you know, everybody down in London was 24 hours glued to the television. The queen was in the outdoors looking after her grandsons, helping them get better. And as the phone calls came up, well, ma'am, you know, people getting worried about this flag over the palace. Well, what does it matter? The, you know, tradition is what matters. We either have the royal standard over the palace or nothing. And then, in the middle of the week, there was a sort of revolution. And it was, in fact, the Thursday after Diana died. And suddenly the Queen looked at the papers. I think one of the reasons why it affected her so much was they all had these, they'd all gone into their archives, the newspapers, and dragged out the most grumpy, grisly, double chin pictures they could of the Queen and said, Where are you, ma'am, when your country needs you? Flinty faced Queen ignores her people. And within 45 minutes, she had changed. Everything had been transformed. There was another service in Balmoral when the vicar, instead of not mentioning Diana, did mention Diana. They came out, and instead of being stony-faced, they went and looked at the flowers. Instead of going down on the royal train overnight, they flew down. Famously, the queen stopped outside Buckingham Palace. I mean, what would it have looked like if if the Queen had just zipped into Buckingham Palace through all the flowers, she thought, oh no, we'll stop, we'll look at the flowers, and then she gave that broadcast. And that was really the turning point. And what people don't know, and what I reveal in my book, is the way in which it was going to be just like every other broadcast she gives, as live, which means half an hour before, she does it, then it goes out on the news. And an hour before, her staff decided, no, we're going to put her on her metal. Her private secretary and her press secretary went in and said to her, you've got to do it live. It's going to have that live impact. She said, OK. She'd never done live before. And she goes in front of the camera with that speech. Somebody said to her that afternoon, Can you, do you really believe everything in this speech? She drafted it. Her private secretaries had drafted it. And also would have gone to the wicked Alistair Campbell in Downing Street. And he looked at it. And he just said one thing. He phoned up the palace and said, do you mind me just suggesting, perhaps if she could say, speaking as a grandmother. And they grabbed it and they put it in. So right at the beginning, she says, speaking to you as your queen and as a grandmother. And that, of course, made sense of the whole week, suddenly. And from that moment, it had turned round. But that was because the queen did two things she hates, expressing her feelings and speaking live on television. And at that moment, she rose to the challenge. And from that moment onwards, everything was all right.